Good morning, everyone. Thank you for taking some time out of your Saturday to join us. And welcome to the first installment of our Masters of Liberal Arts lecture series. The Master of Liberal Arts lecture, or I'm sorry, Master of Liberal Arts or MLA fosters intellectual breadth through courses that address a range of issues from different academic perspectives. It is our hope that these diverse points of views provide insight and promotes discussion beyond the talks in this series. Our theme this year is motion. To be perfectly still or frozen in time is a notable phenomenon. Motion or change of position is a more familiar state. This month, we explore ways that motion is also truly remarkable, having an impact on our physical and social worlds and on a smaller scale, our personal and work lives. There are four talks regarding motion this year. Today, Doug Weems will speak with us about glacial movement and his research on Antarctica to address the global issue of climate change. Doug Marchant, who joins us next Saturday, will focus his discussion on everyday movement, sharing simple practices for being present in our minds and bodies, and shows us that by finding the pleasure in everyday activities, we can disrupt our habitual mindsets and rejuvenate our joy of living. On Saturday, February 19th, Hilary Effenbeam will join us and address emotion at work. Emotion is both a kind of movement and something that moves people. And Effen Beam will explore the power of emotional intelligence as a mover. Our series concludes on the 26th of this month with a return of a macro level view of motion. Zakia Luna will di discuss social movements and their relationship to social change. I hope you will be able to join us for join us for the entire series. In addition, if you know anyone who is interested, please ask them to join. Now for a bit of logistics. You'll see a button uh, at the bottom of your screen that is a Q&A button. You can submit questions at any time. Our speaker has agreed to field questions during the talk and at the end. If you have any technical issues, please use the chat button to ask for help. And now it is my pleasure to introduce our speaker. Douglas Weens is the Robert S. Brookings Distinguished Professor of De in the Department of Earth Science and Planetary Science. He is a fellow of the American Geophysical Union and is the author or co-author of hundreds of articles. He specializes in seismology and geophysics and has done research on deep earthquakes in the Pacific Ocean and the seismology of Antarctica. His court, his taught, he has taught courses on earth forces, seismology, environmental geophysics, and geodynamics. Through his research on the melting of ice sheets and the ensuing sea level rise, Weens is uniquely positioned to talk about climate change. Welcome, Dr. Weens. Well, thank you very much. Uh, it was a great opportunity to be here and, and discuss uh, glaciers, ice sheets, and sea level rise. I think the movement of the glaciers will be uh, maybe the slowest movement that we talk about uh, in, this, uh, in this series, but um, I think you'll see that it's extremely interesting and is not very steady and has um, great implications for you know, the future uh, of this planet. So I think I will go into the lecture then. Um, so I'm starting out uh, with this photo in the background here. Um, that I took uh, from a helicopter as I was flying across the Berg Glacier. And it kind of, uh, I think, gives an idea of what I'm going to be talking about today. So when we think of a glacier, we often think of like a smaller uh, body of ice in the mountains uh, or something like that. Um, in that sense, Berg Glacier is not a glacier because it's about 20 miles wide. Uh, it took the helicopter, you know, like more than 10 minutes to fly across this glacier at more than 100 miles an hour. Um, and in this picture, you can see off in the distance probably about 100 miles. Um, so it's just this vast river of ice, um, like an Amazon type river of ice draining the interior of the Antarctic continent, uh, bringing the ice from the middle of the continent where it falls as snow to the edge of the continent where it melts uh, into the ocean. Um, the motion of this glacier is about 
maybe 10 feet per day or so. Um, so this vast uh, plane of ice is just moving towards the ocean at about 10 feet per day. But not all glaciers move slow and steady like this one, uh, as we'll see today in this, in this discussion. And also the glacier motion varies greatly through, uh, through time. And that's a concern uh, for the future. So one of the sort of really fascinating things for me when I fly over Antarctica in a helicopter or a plane, like in the last photo, is it all of a sudden dawns on me that that's the way that Chicago looked just 17,000 years ago. Um, that you could fly over the North American continent at that time, had people had airplanes, and fly for hours and hours and see only ice. Um, and so on the left is a map of the North American uh, ice sheet. Uh, 17,000 years ago is the, the white, um, you know, in that white band. Uh, around the edge. And about 17,000 years ago, this ice sheet started to melt. <clears throat> and by 7,000 years ago, just 10,000 years later, the ice sheet was essentially gone. So this vast ice sheet disappeared in what to us geologists is just an instant uh, in time. At the same time that this ice sheet was disappearing, it was causing the sea level to rise. And so on the right, you see a, a graph uh, of sea level. Um, and you can see that starting about 17,000 years ago and ending about 7,000 years ago, um, the sea level uh, on this earth rose about 130 meters or about 400 feet. Okay, the elevation of St. Louis above sea level is about 400 some feet. So. You know, that's an amazing rise of sea level. It's equivalent to the height of a 40-story 40 40 building. Um, then, about 7,000 years ago, the collapse of, the, uh, of this North American ice sheet and the ice sheets in Europe ended, and sea level became very, very stable. So throughout, somehow, throughout sort of our recorded history, you know, going, which goes back about maybe six, five or 6,000 years, sea level has been very, very constant. It's given us, it's kind of lulled us into this idea that sea level is going to be very, very stable, um, you know, through time. And we don't think of sea level as changing a lot, but that's just a, a you know, a happenstance of the period of time that we happen to have in recorded history. Um, and it's not, what's happened to sea level over, over longer periods of time. Well, now coming up to the present, we see that, that sea level is starting to change. Um, you can see on this plot here, these are measurements on the, uh, of sea level. Um, it's increased uh, by about 25 centimeters uh, over the last 150 years, or about 10 inches. Not very much. Hasn't had a huge effect yet. Uh, on, you know, on our uh, coastal areas. But then you see that the rate is increasing. And then you see the projections made by uh, climate and ice sheet models um, on the right, suggesting that by the year 2100, we may have a one meter or three foot increase in sea level, which would be substantial and start to cause, um, you know, issues for coastal areas. And then beyond that, the rate just keeps increasing. So, so this is something, uh, and the other thing that we'll come, up, come back to is that these climate effects are sort of like a freight train. Uh, once you get them going in a certain direction, it's very hard to change. So um, this is the concern I think we have, not about the amount of sea level that's already, change that's already happened, but about the increasing rate of change uh, of sea level. And this is intimately connected to the ice sheets. So I'm going to spend a lot of time today talking about the Antarctic ice sheet, which I have, you know, which I do research on. So just a little bit of background. Um, I'm not a climate scientist and I'm not even a glaciologist. Uh, I'm a seismologist and a, a person who uses GPS geodesy um, to keep track very, very accurate to determine very, very accurate positions and, and motions uh, of the Earth. And the seismology I use to study the Earth's structure and also to look at things like ice quakes, 
that produce seismic waves. Um, so I've been to Antarctica eight times um, and I lead a research group that for many years has gone to Antarctica almost every year. Um, and I would also say that you know, the work that I described from my group has just been done by a very large number of, of wonderful people, uh, including students and postdocs and technical help. And here are a couple of pictures of, of those people, both um, you know, our research group dinner and as an Antarctic field team um, in front of our, our plane. Um, so just as an outline of where we're going, I'm gonna start out talking a little bit about um, ice sheets and sea level rise, just the basic science, a few sort of basic concepts to help us understand that better. Then I'll talk a little bit about our work using seismology and geodesy to help constrain the current and future ice loss with the focus on Antarctica. Um, and then it, I'll end up with some general uh, results of models trying to predict the future sea level rise. Um, so that's where we're going. Um, so first of all, the uh, current sea level rise, we talked about that it's not very fast at present. Um, what's causing the current sea level rise? Interestingly enough, the current sea level rise is caused mostly, or the largest effect is from ocean thermal expansion. So as the oceans warm up, we know that they're warming from our, our measurements. Um, as the oceans warm up, they actually uh, you know, thermally expand, uh, you know, increase in volume as they become warmer. Um, and so that raises sea level. Uh, we also have a big contribution from temperate glaciers. Uh, this would be glaciers like in the Alaska Peninsula, uh, melting or Patagonia or the Himalayas. Um, but those glaciers are gonna be largely gone uh, in a number of decades. And over the next few decades, the ice loss from Greenland and Antarctica are going to dominate the causes of sea level. So um, the, over the next few years, we're gonna, our next few decades, we're gonna see Antarctica and Greenland start to dominate um, what's causing global sea level rise. Um, and if we project things way out, so the North America ice sheet and the European ice sheet have collapsed and disappeared, um, we could imagine if the Earth's uh, climate continues to warm that the Greenland and West Antarctic ice sheets may also collapse, although that, according to most models, that won't happen for hundreds of years. But if and when they do, uh, Greenland would contribute seven meters to sea level rise, uh, you know, or more than 20 feet. West Antarctica would contribute five meters or more than 15 feet. Um, and East Antarctica would contribute, um, you know, something like 160 feet. Now, the East Antarctica ice sheet is unlikely to melt completely, but um, additional sea level rise will still be caused by thermal expansion of the oceans. So if we want to project forward, you know, 500 years in the future. So, you know, about the same uh, amount in the future as when North America was settled by, you know, by Europeans or, or um, first, uh, um, you know, settled by Europeans, um, that world would have all coastal cities underwater. So why do we think that um, these ice sheets would be unstable? And I'm going to be focusing on Antarctica quite a bit here. Um, so um, just to explain a little bit about some of the things I'm talking about in terms of Antarctica, there's two main parts of Antarctica. Um, there's uh, East Antarctica, which is generally has a very, has more cold climate and higher land elevations. Um, and that ice sheet tends to be more stable why do we call it East Antarctica? I mean, I get this question all the time because I mean, if you're at the South Pole, you know, what direction is east? What direction is west? Um, so the reason we call it East Antarctica is because it's along the east longitudes. So it's, uh, you know, pointing towards uh, India, Africa, and Australia. They would be off in that direction from the South Pole. Whereas the South Pole is here sort of right about where I labeled East Antarctica. Um, West Antarctica is along the west longitudes, so that's pointing towards South America. 
And uh, so um, it turns out that the West Antarctic ice sheet is quite unstable. And we know that both by looking through the, you know, the geological history that we see uh, in terms of like the plant fossils and so forth that we see there, um, and also according to models. And this is the result here. I'm gonna show you the result of a model, a coupled climate and ice sheet model that um, in this model, they, uh, they increase the amount of greenhouse gases uh, in the model for uh, one section of time, and then they reduce them again to simulate what happens over what we call an interglacial, which is the period of time between ice ages. And whoops, let's see, I'm trying to start that. There we go. So you can see that um, as you increase the amount of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, the East End, or the Western Arctic ice sheet just kind of melts away. Um, it just collapses um, until there's almost no ice sheet left and the ocean comes in. Um, then when you decrease the amount of greenhouse gases, then the ice sheet builds back up to about where it is now or even bigger. Um, so this, this instability of the Western Arctic ice sheet, we're gonna talk a little bit more about the reasons for it later, um, but it seems to be due to the factors like the, the warmth of the oceans in that area of the, and the, also the topography of the land. So now just to think a little bit about um, ice sheets, the continental ice sheet, if you cover a whole continent with, with an ice sheet, like Antarctica or like North America was 17,000 years ago. Um, if you go to the middle of the ice sheet, um, like when I go to South Pole, you could imagine that in the middle of this ice sheet here, um, the, temp the maximum temperature at South Pole when I'm there um, is about minus 10 Fahrenheit, okay? So maybe gets a little bit above that on a really hot day. Um, so, you know, makes our weather in St. Louis here look really, really hot. Um, so nothing ever melts there. There's not a single day of melting, you know, in the middle of Antarctica where the snow would ever melt. But yet you have snow that falls in this area. So, you know, what happens? The snow just builds up year after year after year after year. Um, does it, will it build up indefinitely? Well, no, because the ice has to move. So the ice slowly moves away from the area where the, where the um, ice snow accumulates and never melts to the edge of the continent where the ice actually melts. And um, so that motion really, and the rate of that motion determines then how thick this ice sheet is. And that rate of motion can be controlled by things like, like the, the, you know, the, how, the, how easily the, the ice flows and also by maybe how much friction there is at the base uh, of the ice sheet um, and things like whether there's an ice shelf uh, protecting the ice sheet uh, where it comes to the ocean. Okay, so that's just kind of the basic way that a continental ice sheet, ice sheet works. So when we look at Antarctica here on the left is a map showing the velocity of the ice uh, everywhere in Antarctica from, from radar. And you can see that most of the continent has a, a red color or a green color that shows that there's very slow uh, rate of motion, you know, in those areas, you know, less than a foot a day uh, in most places. So you would never even notice that <clears throat> these areas are moving. Um, at the South Pole, every year they have to move the little pole that shows the location of the South Pole by about um, 20 feet or so um, to make up for the how much the ice is moved uh, at the South Pole. Um, it's not moving very fast. Um, but then as you get towards the edge of the continent, you see these kind of rivers of blue that are sticking into the continent. These are the ice streams like the Bird Glacier that I showed you at the beginning. And those are just vast, you know, wide areas, many maybe 10 or 20 miles wide, <clears throat> where the ice is moving much, much faster. The ice is moving, you know, maybe 10 feet a day, something like that, which is just galloping along uh, for ice. And that's how we bring ice from the center part of the continent to the edge. And so how much ice there is in Antarctica really is, is very, very determined by 
how fast these ice streams are moving. And so the whole idea of why they move so fast is a big subject of research. Why can they move without hardly any friction on the base of the ice stream? And we think it's due to the fact that there's, there's water at the bottom of these ice streams that kind of lubricates uh, you know, the flow of the ice uh, over the ground uh, at, these, um, at these places. <clears throat> So then the question is, how do we measure ice sheet changes? We want to know if the ice sheet is changing. Is it actually melting or not? Um, <clears throat> so there's sort of three technologies here that are important. There's the satellite laser altimeter that just basically measures the height of the snow. Uh, it doesn't measure the mass, though, or whether the snow is um, you know, puff, uh, fluffy or hard or wet. Then there's <clears throat> the GRACE satellite. Uh, which actually measures the gravity from the ice sheet, which measures extremely, extremely accurately any changes in gravity. And it's kind of this really ingenious, it's actually two satellites that follow each other around the Earth and measure the distance between them very accurately with microwaves. And when they go over an area of the Earth that has higher gravity, you know, one of them will be accelerated more than the other. Um, and so then from that, uh, scientists can back out the gravitational field and look for any changes in the gravitational field due to changes in the mass. As you know, by Newton's law, every piece of mass actually um, contributes to the gravitational field. So, um, so we can look at changes in, in the locations of, of ice sheets or the thicknesses of ice sheets by their changes of gravity. And in one that I'll talk about a lot here uh, is the fact that when we put ice, you know, onto some land, it will push the land down. Um, we, and we take the ice away, the land will come back up. Uh, and we can measure that using uh, GPS uh, measurements, GPS geodesy. And this is the same technology, basically, that you use uh, in the GPS receiver in your car, you know, when, when you try to find uh, you try to find your way to, um, you know, to some store to buy something <clears throat> that's using the same GPS technology only, of course, we apply sort of extremely um, more sensitive processing to it in order to get very small changes uh, in the position of GPS receivers and determine whether the land is coming up or going down. Doug, I have a, a couple of quick questions if you... Um, sure. Okay. Um, so the first question is, if ice sheets move regardless of warming, how do scientists measure what movement is due to regular flow and climate warming? Oh, that's a really good question. So um, what we try to do is we try to measure the changes uh, in how the ice is moving. And actually, that's a really good question in terms of being timely here, because we're just coming to the discussion of how we measure changes, um, you know, changes in ice. And the the figure that I have up here right now um, is a it's a movie, um, and it's showing changes in the Antarctic ice mass um, over the last well from 2002 to 2020. Um, based on the GRACE satellite measuring gravity. And um, what you see on this, uh, you know, on this movie is basically, you know, starting in about year 2006 or so, um, the satellite detected, you know, much less gravity over this area of West Antarctica near the coastline that's turning orange uh, on this map. And what that means is that there's a, you know, there's a loss of mass there's a loss of ice uh, in that area uh, of West Antarctica. Um, and so, you know, basically then you can see that there are changes relative to the baseline of what was going on in year 2002. So, uh, you know, it's true that the motion of all these ice streams and so forth, you can't separate out exactly the amount that's due to climate change and the amount that's due to natural processes, but we can look for changes relative to what was happening, you know, decades ago uh, when things were more stable. And so what we see, you know, in this figure here uh, is that, you know, this coastline of West Antarctica here 
is losing ice very rapidly. And um, as we go on, we'll see there's other evidence for that too, in addition to the GRACE satellite results. And the ice loss there seems to be focused around this um, ice stream or glacier called Thwaites. So you may, if you read some news reports, um, some of the reporters are starting to call that the Doomsday Glacier. Um, I'm not sure that that's uh, really quite appropriate, but um, it is the glacier that seems to be losing mass the fastest. And there's a lot of concern about that, uh, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Was there another, another question? Okay, well, I guess, I guess I'll go on. Um, so, um, Oops, I'm sorry, the question is due and to the movement of glaciers. Pardon, I, I think I missed part of the question. Okay, um, so the question is, do earthquakes affect one, the rise and fall of sea level and two, the movement of glaciers? Um, earthquakes don't have a very, very strong effect um, on the movement of glaciers. One thing is that there aren't many natural earthquakes in Antarctica or Greenland. Um, and so they don't seem to have sort of a direct uh, effect on ice, on ice sheets. Um, what I'll show in a little bit though, is that when ice uh, streams and ice sheets move, they often produce seismic waves. And so we can study them, you know, in a similar way to the way that we study um, maybe earthquakes uh, with seismographs. There has been some wondering whether if a big tsunami hit um, Antarctica, whether that would produce uh, a large change in the ice shelves. Um, and that is possibly feasible, but it hasn't been observed yet. Okay, so I'm gonna now talk about this glacial isostatic adjustment, which is how the land adjusts to changes in the ice, um, in the ice mass. So um, the solid earth responds to changes um, in the ice mass, um, which can occur over tens to thousands of years. So as we put more and more ice on the land, it pushes the land down. And what actually happens is quite remarkable um, is this, occurs because deep in the earth, like about a hundred miles deep, the mantle of the earth um, is actually, I would say it's a substance sort of with characteristics sort of like um, tar, like road tar. It's a solid, but it can actually flow. So like road tar, you might know, looks very solid, but on a really hot day, it may start to flow a little bit. Um, and so that's kind of what the interior of the earth is like. Over here, I have a diagram of where somebody put road tar uh, for a scientific experiment, you know, um, and it is measuring how long it takes for it to flow. And it actually takes years for it to flow uh, in this case, but it does flow like a liquid. Um, so the interior of the earth can flow um, outward to respond to the to the ice mass. And then if we take the ice mass away, the, the interior of the earth flows back and then the crust comes back up. Um, and the, the response there is delayed by the amount of time that it takes the earth to flow, you know, either away uh, or back. Um, and it turns out this is important because we need to understand the land uplift to correct the gravity estimates of ice loss and also to model you know, future ice sheet changes because the future ice sheet changes will depend on the elevation of the land. Um, so, you know, the key observations that we need there are to determine the elevation of the land from the GPS receivers. Um, and then also we need to estimate what really is the viscosity uh, of the deep earth because that will determine how fast this process happens. So, you can actually see post-glacial rebound um, if you go to places like Canada or Sweden. I had the privilege of going to Sweden and um, going to this place where Celsius, the guy that, in, uh, that invented the, the, uh, you know, the Celsius scale, therm thermometer scale, he was also interested in sea level. Um, and so he marked on this rock 
1731 where the sea level was. And this is about a 10 foot high rock. Um, and so then, you know, in 1831, the sea level had moved down about uh, two or three feet. And now you can see currently the sea level is like eight feet below where it was uh, in 1731. Um, similarly, nearby, they have these boat houses that are, were made where they would, you know, sail the small boats into the house for repairs and for storage. But they're now risen up so that you can no longer do that. Um, so is the sea level falling in this area? And we talk about sea level rise. So is the sea level falling in this area? Well, no, the land is rising because there used to be two miles of ice on top of Sweden. Um, and in about 10,000 years ago, it disappeared. And so the land is still coming up. And the land in Sweden is coming up very slowly because the viscosity of the Earth's mantle is very high uh, below this area. Um, so it's still coming up and it's still coming up in Canada too. So um, that's what we wanna measure then in Antarctica. Uh, and in, um, we also wanna have seismic stations that will help us understand the viscosity structure uh, of the deep earth. So my group has been involved in going to Antarctica and deploying these uh, GPS receivers to measure the and up land uplift due to ice loss and the seismographs to measure earth structure and estimate uh, viscosity. Um, and they operate year round uh, and including they have to operate through the polar night, which lasts for about four to six months of complete darkness. Um, so if you look at this picture of the GPS um, station, there's solar panels to keep it powered during the, during the winter, I mean, I'm sorry, during the summer, and then they charge the batteries, which are in these boxes here, um, and so that it can operate over winter. And in the measurements actually come from this um, kind of mushroom shaped thing uh, over here to the right on the rock. And so we're very accurately measuring how the elevation changes of that rock. Um, and for the seismographs, we have a similar power system, but then the seismograph itself is buried under that, uh, under that orange dome. And so we worked and worked to try to make these systems work in Antarctica, and there were a lot of technical challenges. So um, Antarctica you know, has uh, winter surface temperatures that are as low as 100, minus 110 Fahrenheit. I never went there in winter, fortunately. Um, but um, in up to six months of, of complete darkness, um, it's inaccessible most of the year. So if something fails, you have to wait a year to go back and fix it. Um, so, you know, so we have it's been quite an operation to put these systems out across Antarctica. Um, and this, these pictures here just show some of the, you know, some of the field operations that we that we went to, uh, that we undertook to, in order to do this, um, you know, you see a typical seismograph installation there on the upper left with solar panels and in the battery box. Um, <clears throat> we went to the sites of most of our seismic stations and GPS stations using the Twin Otter aircraft with skis um, and landing just on the on the glaciers or the ice streams with the skis. Um, sometimes having to fill up, you know, with gas in remote places like is shown here. Um, we have several times taken very long trips um, with snowmobiles uh, over land. Um, the Conestoga here is a shelter in case there's a really severe storm um, and you don't have time to put up your tents. Um, and, uh, you know, we generally live in tents when we do this kind of, uh, this kind of work. Um, but in the end, we have these sites, you know, distributed across large parts of Antarctica and are able to study a lot of interesting things. And one of the first things we discovered was that ice streams um, are not all slow and steady. Um, so GPS receivers on the Willens Ice Stream um, show that the motion uh, is, is in this graph here to the left. So basically the ice stream stays in one place for about half a day. 
uh, and then it suddenly jumps forward uh, by about um, up to two feet. Um, and then it stays in one place for another half day and then jumps ahead. The area that jumps ahead is 120 miles by 60 miles. So it's an area much larger than the St. Louis metro area is all suddenly jumping forward uh, at the same time. And then we can kind of map out how that happens here on the right. <clears throat> There's a map up here that shows the white line shows the edge of the ice stream. And I'll show the color contours here will show the parts, uh, the rate at which the at which the ice stream is moving. And then at the bottom is a seismograph that shows that when it moves, it actually produces seismic waves that are recorded four minutes later um, at this seismograph at the South Pole. So um, this entire you know, huge area uh, jumps forward and does not move uh, you know, very slowly and steadily. Um, and we think this has to do with the friction at the base of the ice stream and with the amount of water that it may dry out and become wet again uh, and change the friction uh, at the base. So another thing that we've discovered is that there are huge differences in the mantle viscosity. Or in other words, how fast the land will respond to ice change across Antarctica. So. Um, this is a map uh, of Antarctica um, at two depths, 100 kilometers, about 60 miles deep, uh, and about 180 miles deep. Um, and what you see is East Antarctica, shown in blue here, uh, is much colder than West Antarctica at those depths. And so, um, like molasses, if you put it in the freezer, it doesn't flow very fast, <clears throat> or honey. And if you uh, put it in the oven, it flows really fast. So it, East Antarctica is much colder at depth than West Antarctica, and so the mantle doesn't flow there very fast. So that means that East Antarctica is going to respond to changes in math than ice load um, over thousands of years, but West Antarctica will respond very quickly uh, in tens to a hundred years. So another thing that we measured um, is the actual uplift. Uh, of the land surface caused by the ice melting. Um, so on the right, this shows the results from the GPS receivers. And the, this uh, section of lectures is on motion. So you can see the motion here of the land uh, is coming up almost everywhere due to the ice melting. But it's extremely large along the sea coast uh, of West Antarctica here. So we're getting upward motion of the land of about 16 inches per year, which is actually the largest uplift recorded anywhere in the world for land. So something really remarkable is happening here. Um, and that agrees very well with what we see from the gray satellite changing gravity, which shows that all of this ice is being lost uh, in West Antarctica along that sea coast. So this is further evidence that all of the, you know, that huge amounts of ice are being lost uh, in this area around the Thwaites Glacier uh, on the sea coast of West Antarctica. Um, and the rapid uplift also is consistent with the fact that the mantle viscosity is very low here. The mantle is flowing back very quickly and allowing the land to come up uh, very fast. So why are we having so much ice mass loss? Uh, why are we losing so much ice in West Antarctica? Well, we think it's due to the marine, something called the marine ice sheet instability. So basically in West Antarctica, the, the land surface is like shown in this figure. So it actually gets lower and deeper as you go towards the continent and away from the ocean. And so as the ice sheet starts to become thinner, that then allows the ocean to flow underneath the ice sheet. Why is that important? Well, the ocean is warm. It brings warmth in there. I mean, it's not warm to you and me. It's you know like 35 degrees Fahrenheit or something like that. So it would feel very cold to us, but it's warmer than the ice and it's bringing you know, heat energy um, underneath the ice sheet and starting to melt it faster. And so 
what we have here then is a runaway effect where as the ice sheet gets thinner, the ocean comes underneath the ice sheet more. As the ocean comes underneath the ice sheet more, it brings more heat. As it brings more heat, it melts the ice sheet more Then that's causing the ice sheet to become thinner. And so you have a runaway feedback loop. Um, and so that is what we think is caught is happening at Thwaites Glacier, at this area where we're losing so much, um, so much ice. And the danger is that that might just happen all across West Antarctica and cause the West Antarctic ice sheet to collapse. Um, so a big question though, is how the land surface will respond to that um, and how fast will the land surface come back? Because as shown in this figure here in the right, you know, if the land surface starts to come up very rapidly as the ice sheet thins, that will help slow down this runaway effect uh, of the um, marine ice sheet instability. Um, and our results showing that we have very low mantle viscosity in this area because the mantle is very warm, um, as shown by this, you know, these red colors here on this figure on the left, um, suggests that the land will uplift there rapidly. And that may help slow down this marine ice sheet instability. There have now been some models that have incorporated this effect. Um, and they suggest that this effect will slow down the marine ice sheet instability, but it won't entirely eliminate it. So, you know, there's, I guess, a little bit of good news that this effect may slow down the marine ice sheet instability, but the bad news is it's probably not enough to stop it from happening altogether. So, um, so now for the last part of the talk, I'm going to talk a little bit about ice sheet predictions. You know, where does this sea level predictions, where does this leave us in terms of understanding how fast sea level is going to change uh, in the future? I mean, since we don't live in Antarctica or Greenland, um, the ice sheet itself doesn't sort of have a super direct effect on us. But if it changes sea level around the world, um, that's going to have a big effect uh, on the global economy. Um, so um, the first thing I would say here, and this is really a very interesting thing, um, sea level rise will vary around the world, okay? So the ocean is not a bathtub, okay? So we talk about like the bathtub model for sea level rise, which is like if in your bathtub, if you, in, you, know, if you pour more water in your bathtub, the level of the bathtub increases the same amount across all, you know, across the whole bathtub. So, you know, I think simplistically we think about increasing sea level is like pouring more water in the ocean. And so the sea level should rise the same amount everywhere around the world. But that's not the way it works. The earth is much more complicated than a bathtub. So uh, what happens actually is shown here on the left. So the gravity from the, from the ice sheet, if you have a big ice sheet like Antarctica or Greenland, that ice sheet actually has a big gravitational pull because it's so massive, you know, miles thick of ice. Um, and so that gravity actually pulls the sea level, the, the seawater towards the ice sheet. And so, you know, unusually raises the sea level near the ice sheet. So now what happens then when we melt the ice sheet. Well, when we melt the ice sheet now, there's, you know, there's that gravitational attraction from the ice sheet on the ocean, uh, on the ocean is gone. And so the sea level will actually possibly go down very near the ice sheet, even though you've poured more water, you know, into the ocean. So that means these maps on the right take that effect into account and show how one meter of sea level rise would be distributed around the world um, if it was caused by Greenland melting on the left, uh, or if it was caused by West Antarctica melting uh, on the right. And on the left, uh, you can see that if the sea level rise is caused by Greenland melting, it doesn't raise the sea level at all in Canada or in uh, Scotland or Norway, okay? It actually makes, the sea level go down uh, in those areas. Um, it raises sea level just a little bit in North America and it raises sea level a lot uh, in South America. And then you have the opposite. Uh, if you have 
sea level rise caused by melting in West Antarctica, um, where you have a big amount of sea level rise in North America actually uh, caused by the melting in, uh, in West Antarctica. So, so sea level in North America is more sensitive to ice melting in Antarctica than in Greenland, okay? Um, and sea level rise will be different at you know, different places across the world. Now, of course, we expect ice to melt both in Greenland and in West Antarctica. So what will actually happen will be some combination of these, but it, it is very sensitive to where the ice is actually melting. Um, so that's kind of uh, an important consideration. <clears throat> and then, you know, what will happen uh, as the climate warms to the Antarctic ice sheet? So here on the left, we see um, at the top are the climate models, basically showing how much carbon dioxide greenhouse gases are in the, are in the atmosphere. And these are um, scenarios. The scenario 2.6 here assumes that we immediately start to reduce uh, carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And the red line shows a scenario where we keep increasing the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere till two year two, 2020, I'm sorry, 2200. And when we look then at what will happen to sea level, um, well, first of all, on the right, you can see in the, uh, the, the model shows that in the year 2500, um, basically for, if we reduce carbon dioxide immediately, um, most of Antarctica ice sheet is still there. Uh, whereas if we kind of allow carbon dioxide to increase for the next 150 years, um, then the Antarctic ice, the Western Antarctic ice sheet is completely gone. And parts of the East Antarctic ice sheet are also melting. And sea level will have risen, you know, by, you know, like 13 meters uh, by 2,500. Um, so um, that shows the effect in Antarctica. And then this is the results from the 2019 Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, which it basically averages a lot of models and so um, tries to determine from the average of all the models what is likely to happen, but also to give a range of what is possible. And, um, you know, basically the orange line here shows the, you know, if we basically continue on the present path in terms of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And in the blue line shows what happens if we immediately reduce uh, carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Um, and you can see that basically for the case where we don't reduce the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere by year 2100, sea level will have increased by almost a meter. <clears throat> and by year 2300, it will have increased by about four meters. So um, you know, very substantial increases uh, in sea level. And if we then look at, you know, what that means, so in by 2300, <clears throat> if the sea level has increased by four meters, that would mean that all the orange and red areas on this map would be covered by, by ocean. So that, you know, much of Louisiana would be covered by the ocean, uh, much of Southern Florida would be covered by the ocean. Okay, so that's a pretty catastrophic um, scenario. It is, it won't happen right away. Um, it won't happen for, you know, in our lifetimes. Um, but it's like a freight train. Once we start it, it's going to be very difficult to stop. Um, and so, you know, I think that's the concern that we are changing things for our future uh, generations and the problem of sea level, you know, will become uh, worse and worse. Uh, based on our decisions that we're making uh, right now. It won't be something that can be turned around uh, very easily. Um, incidentally, one other interesting thing of this map is this outer uh, line here between the blue uh, and kind of the tan color here. That's 130 meters below the current sea level. So that's where the sea level was 17,000 years ago. Um, and just to give you an idea of, you know, how big changes in sea level can possibly be. Um, okay, well, that's basically it for the talk, and uh, I'd be glad to take some, uh, some questions.
Okay, thank you um, so much, Professor Weins. That was um, really interesting. And of course, um, of course, reason for concern for all of us. Um, I, I wanna say before I start answering questions, my internet's a little bit unstable. So my colleague, John, will um, jump in if, if I um, go out. Um, I wanna start, a few people are curious just about your experience in Antarctica. Okay, it looks so like she's having what questions. What time of year do you go? Um, can you hear me? You're jumping um, in now, Pat. I'll go ahead and. Okay. Um, so there was a question with regards to what type of what time of the year is your team able to go to the Antarctica continent, and how long do you stay? Yeah, that's a good question. So uh, we we only go during the Antarctic summer. Um, and so typically we would leave St. Louis maybe in October, late October, um, go through New Zealand uh, and then, um, you know, arrive in Antarctica maybe in November. Um, you, we fly commercial to New Zealand and then we fly from New Zealand to McMurdo, the main US base uh, uh, on uh, U, US Air Force National Guard planes. Um, either C-130s or C-17s. Um, and then, uh, you know, fly from there out to the field sites in smaller, smaller planes. Um, and we would possibly be there from November to maybe early January. Most field seasons, we are maybe in Antarctica, maybe about five or six weeks um, altogether. Um, and, uh, but it can vary a lot from, from year to year. Um, and, uh, you know, and then come back, uh, in early, early January. So, you know, during that time, that is the hot, the warmest time of the year in Antarctica. And it very, the temperature there will vary a lot near the oceans. Um, it's actually not terribly different from the weather that you would have here at that time of the year. Um, you know, sort of about 30 degrees or so, uh, frequently, um, but if you go to the interior of Antarctica, like the South Pole, it would be sort of minus 20, uh, minus 10. And that's, you know, basically the Antarctic summer. And there's another question in relationship to the weather. Does your body acclimate to the temperatures in the Antarctic? And when you come back to St. Louis, what do you typically wear? Yeah, yeah. Well, um, I grew up in Minnesota, so I was a little bit familiar with cold weather and so forth. Um, so your body really does get used to it, um, you know, especially if you're camping um, so that you're basically, you know, in a tent overnight. And uh, we usually, when we are at a field camp, we have a heated, um, you know, eating area and area to meet, uh, you know, and discuss our strategy and so forth. Um, but you get kind of used to it. You get kind of in, you know, in the groove uh, of being there. And, uh, you know, basically I don't think I've, you know, experienced as cold weather in Antarctica as the very worst weather that I ever experienced in Minnesota. So, um, you know, it, it is something that you can get used to. The worst is if you get a really windy day because, um, you know, the wind will then, uh, you know, possibly freeze any expose part of your skin. So you have to be very careful not to get frostbite. So here's another question. Why do you think there are not a lot of earthquakes in the two areas that you've been talking about? Iceland and, Ar and Antarctica. Uh, well, in, in, uh, in Antarctica, well, in both, case, in both areas, you're not along a plate boundary. So most of the, most of the earthquakes in the world are along plate boundaries like um, say um, California is, uh, you know, San Andreas Fault is actually a plate boundary where North America is moving, you know, by about two inches a year relative to, you know, the Pacific Ocean side of the fault. So um, there's no plate boundaries like that um, in Antarctica or Greenland. So, so that just means um, there won't be as many, uh, many earthquakes. There has been a theory that the ice actually inhibits the occurrence of earthquakes. Um, 
but we did a study and we found some earthquakes in Antarctica and um, about the same number of earthquakes as you would have, like say in the middle of a continent um, like North America, like if you go away from the New Madrid seismic zone, you know, like what you'd have in the rest of say the Midwest here. Um, so we don't actually subscribe to that theory that the ice sheet will actually inhibit uh, earthquakes. There are some earthquakes, it's just um, not a very large number and not enough to really uh, influence the ice sheet. Okay, here's another question with regards to when you were talking about the motion. Do you feel that kind of jump when you're working there? <laughs> That's a good question. So um, actually, no. So people don't notice it um, because you know, I described it as a, as a jerk or as a jump, but it does happen over a few minutes. So, um, you know, if you're standing at a particular spot, that spot will move, you know, more rapidly, you know, for about, you know, a few minutes, five minutes, and it'll stop. Um, and so that is, you know, so you're basically then moving about two feet, you know, over a period of about five minutes. Uh, and that's, you know, too slow of a change to really feel it um, yourself. So people had actually, actually there'd been uh, glaciologists working on that ice stream for several decades, you know, going back to the 1960s um, and not knowing that the ice stream, you know, was jerking like that until GPS receivers were put there. Um, you know, so, so yeah, it's not something that you can actually sense um, when you're there. From, uh, do you mind if I stop your, your screen share so that the audience can oh, see? Yeah, it? go ahead. Okay. All right, uh, another question here. How is the St. Louis area moving compared to the Celsius rock? Ah, St. Louis is not moving up or down very much um, because because St. Louis wasn't covered by the last ice, uh, by the ice during the last ice age. So if you go back 17,000 years ago, like that map that I showed you there, the edge of the, the edge of the ice sheet was actually between St. Louis and Chicago. So if you drive along like Interstate 55 going up to Chicago, you can find, you know, all sorts of piles of dirt, if you know what you're looking for there that were laid down by the edge of that ice sheet. Um, and so because St. Louis wasn't covered by the ice sheet, uh, it isn't moving very rapidly, um, you know, to rebound back up uh, after the, uh, you know, after the, uh, the melting of that ice sheet. So, um, you know, St. Louis is not moving very much, but if you went up to, um, like in Canada, around Hudson's Bay um, or Winnipeg, um, you know, that area is moving up still quite rapidly. Well, I mean, from a geologic sense, quite rapidly. So the next question here, why is the Indian Ocean so greatly affected by West Antarctica? Uh, the Indian Ocean. Um, oh, in terms of, uh, I see what you're talking about. You're, you're talking about the um, distribution of sea level rise uh, from, uh, from, um, the distribution of sea level rise from the melting of the of the um, of the ice sheet. Um, yeah, actually, I'm trying to remember why that is. Um, I think it's due to. Um, yeah, I'm not quite sure why why the Indian Ocean would be more affected than other areas at similar distance from West Antarctica. I mean, one reason is it's because it's not very close to West Antarctica. So West Antarctica is over by South America um, and the Indian Ocean is kind of on the opposite side of Antarctica. So, um, <clears throat> so that would be part of the reason why the Indian Ocean would be, have a large um, sea level rise. But um, those calculations take into account um, a number of other factors like different viscosities in different parts of the earth. So um, there must be some effect also that makes it higher. Another question with regards to thinking of the loss of the Canadian ice and ensuring land uplift, does that to some degree counter sea level rise on the coast since the continent is continuous? Well, yeah, I mean, <clears throat> that's true on the coastline of, of like say Newfoundland or 
uh, Hudson Bay, um, as sea level rises, you know, due to, you know, overall sea level rise, the land will still be going up. And so there, yeah, there won't be probably much change in some of those areas. So, I mean, you could see, for example, in the, in the picture that I showed of Sweden, that um, the effect of the land going up there has, you know, still been larger than the effect of sea level rise, you know, even over the last hundred years uh, when we had sea level rise due to ice melting. So and that will go on for a while, um, you know, because the uplift of the land will still be in those places that were covered by the ice sheets will still be larger than the sea level rise caused by, you know, overall sea level rise. Thank you. But that Excellent. won't extend to the, like the east coast of the U.S. Um, is not, the land is not going up. So like New York, um, you know, Baltimore, um, North Carolina, uh, those kind of places um, are, the land is not going up. So they're going to bear the brunt of, of sea level rise, um, particularly from, you know, the, the ice that would melt in West Antarctica. Thank you. Next question is the permafrost warming and large release of stored carbon within the soils a concern in Antarctica or has it not experienced enough organic life decomposition over the past to have stored large amounts of carbon at risk of release into the atmosphere? Yeah, I don't think that that's a very big concern for Antarctica. I don't think there's compared to the Arctic areas, um, there are just not um, as large uh, amounts of organic material that's stored in the permafrost. Um, I mean, there is obviously permafrost and as Antarctica, <clears throat> as Antarctica warms up, some of that permafrost is going to, is going to um, you know, be uh, destabilized, um, but it's not nearly a, as big of a concern in Antarctica as it is in the Arctic areas like Alaska or Siberia. Thank you. Next question, with the melting of the ice sheet, this will contribute a large amount of fresh water to the oceans. This will change uh, its sal sal salinity and hence its density. It has been suggested that the melting of the North American ice sheet contributes to such change over a relatively short time. It's been suggested that this affected the North American circulator and contributed to a cooling of Europe called the longer um, dry ass. Dry ass, yeah. Hence, what is the prediction of the effect of all of this fresh water contributing to the climate? Could there be another interglacial cooling in North Europe or elsewhere? Huh, that's a really interesting question. And <clears throat> I mean, it's a question probably for an oceanographer more than, um, you know, than a seismologist like myself. I have not seen any papers that have predicted such a thing. Um, I have heard of that idea as a, as a cause for the younger dryas. Um, but, um, but I'm not sure if anybody has made that prediction, you know, about the current, you know, about the current global warming. One of the issues that that would say maybe it's not as much of an uh, much of a concern is the, the the North American ice sheet was was gigantic. It was um, you know bigger than the than the whole Antarctic ice sheet uh, or the whole Green, Greenland ice sheet. So the amount of fresh water that was dumped into the ocean during the rapid collapse of the Laurentide ice or the North American ice sheet, you know, won't be replicated again, <clears throat> um, you know, when, <clears throat> when Antarctica melts um, or when Greenland melts. So, so it <clears throat> may not be quite as much of an issue uh, there just because you don't have quite as much fresh water coming in quite as fast. Um, but it'd be interesting to see if anybody has looked into that in detail. Thank you. Next question. In the event of a Tusami wave hitting the ice sheets, has anyone calculated the effect of freezing point depression from salt in the ocean water? Um, not to my knowledge. Uh, there have been some studies, including ones that I've been involved in, where we've looked at the impact of tsunami waves on the Ross ice shelf, which is the biggest ice shelf in Antarctica. And we've measured, you know, we've measured like how much the ice shelf moves up and down. And we've looked for like whether there were little ice quakes uh, in response to the tsunami hitting. And we didn't really see much <clears throat> of an effect, but 
um, this was for sort of a moderate sized tsunami. I think it was from the, uh, the uh, Chile earthquake in 2010. Um, and uh, one could imagine a bigger tsunami from, you know, from possible future earthquakes. So, um, but I haven't actually looked, I don't know if anybody's looked into the effect that was mentioned. Thank you. Next question. Do the models assume that the land elevation of the rest of the Earth outside of Antarctica, wouldn't a seven meter rise in the ocean tend to depress the level of seabed and thus raise the level of dry land? Yeah, that's um, that's another second order effect that um, has to be taken into account. I mean, uh, in giving this lecture, I left off, you know, many smaller effects that will be important. Um, if you want to sort of really accurately predict sea level rise at a given area. And one of these would be the effect that the questioner is mentioning, the fact that when you, <clears throat> when you increase sea level, uh, then you're changing the load, <clears throat> you know, on the ocean beds. And that will, uh, yeah, that will depress the ocean beds to a certain extent. And it's another reason why the bathtub model doesn't work there are these effects of, you know, the change in sea level actually changing the, the sea floor. Um, and, you know, those effects have to be taken into account if you want to make a really accurate prediction. Thank you. Next question. There's a few of these. Uh, during your time in Antarctica, did you see any penguins, plants, or any type of uh, life? Yeah. Outside is that of other people? <clears throat> Yeah, that depends on really strongly on where you go <clears throat> in Antarctica. So, um, my first Antarctic project was in the was in the Antarctic Peninsula, and that is just a beautiful place. So, um, you know, one of the places we went, um, we worked on a near a beach that was just completely covered with different species of penguins and um, a lot of uh, elephant seals and. Uh, fur seals and, uh, um, you know, various kinds of birds, um, just an amazing place <clears throat> and just full of life because the ocean there is very uh, productive. And so the, you know, the animals find lots of food in the ocean and then they come to the beach to, to nest. Other places in Antarctica, like if you go to the South Pole, you'll see nothing. Um, because the interior has no source of, you know, of food for the, for any animals. So um, the most you might see would be like a, uh, like a, a skua that got blown off course, um, which is just a bird, um, you know, and found itself lost uh, in the middle of the continent. Um, so around the coasts of Antarctica, though, you see, you see lots of wildlife and, uh, um, like in McMurdo, the main U.S. base, um, when you first get there, uh, like in October, the, the edge of the ice shelf is way out to sea, so you don't see hardly any penguins or anything. But if you stay till January, the edge of the ice comes close, and then you start seeing penguins and seals a lot. Thank you. Next question. Are there any other effects of ice loss? in Antarctica other than sea level rise, any relationships between ice loss, sea level, and volcanic activity? Yeah, that's a really good question um, because um, we know that under some circumstances, uh, the ice loss can increase volcanic activity. Um, for example, uh, if you, people who've gone to Iceland uh, and studied it in detail, it used to be during the last ice age, it was covered by a huge ice sheet, you know, the whole island. Um, but then that ice sheet collapsed about 10,000 years ago, and there was a big surge of volcanism at about the same time. So uh, we think that basically the, you know, the, 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 the loss of the ice reduced the pressure that was holding, you know, the, that was hold, essentially, you know, keeping the magma from degassing and, and holding it in the magma chamber. And so that allowed more eruptions. Um, another idea is that just by moving the, the, the deep earth upward, it's causing pressure release melting and more magma to form. So there is this connection between the collapse of ice sheets and volcanism. Um, 
so that is a possible issue down the road if the whole Western Arctic ice sheet, you know, um, disappeared. Um, we have my work. We have found a volcano underneath a previously unknown volcano underneath the ice sheet in West Antarctica, um, which seems to be somewhat active, um, but are potentially active. Um, but um, it's not clear that there would be a real linkage where the volcanoes would cause the ice sheet to melt faster. Um, but definitely increased volcanism is a possible outcome of, you know, of the ice sheet collapse. Thank you. Coming back to the wildlife uh, questions, have you observed any changes in the wildlife in West or East Antarctica? Yeah, I, I can't comment on that because I don't go back to the same place, you know, often enough in a systematic way. Um, there are, of course, biologists that study this um, all the time. And, uh, you know, now they can use like satellite photos and things like that to keep track of the, at least for the larger animals like, like emperor penguins, you know, the, the um, you know, the numbers of, of, of um, the animals. So, um, so there's definitely those studies going on. I'm just not very familiar with them. Thank you. Next question. Does the mass of the extremely cold ice sheets themselves contribute to global temperatures? Um, well, certainly the ice sheets contribute greatly to the, to the climate, affect the climate uh, in a huge way <clears throat> because um, ice, of course, is white. And so it um, reflects sunlight back into space. So there's a feedback effect that, like, say, when the North American ice sheet started to grow bigger and bigger, that meant that more and more sunlight in North America was reflected back into space, uh, which meant that, um, you know, it got colder and colder. So, you know, as the ice sheet grew bigger, then the, cl the climate became colder. And as the climate became colder, then the ice sheet grew bigger and so forth. So, so that's part, that's really a large part of the reason why the whole system is very unstable. There's these feedback effects where, you know, the growth of an ice sheet affects the climate, you know, th then as the climate becomes colder or warmer than that, feedback feeds back into the ice sheet and keeps, go, you know, keeps either the growth or the melting going on. So, um, you know, I guess at the beginning, I said this is a very unstable system and I showed you the re, I showed you evidence that the system is unstable, but <clears throat> you know some of the reasons that it's unstable. That's probably one of the primary ones: is this this feedback between the ice sheet and climate. How the you know the growth of the ice sheet cools the climate, and the collapse of the ice sheet you know warms the climate. And so that's a big concern now, because for example, in the Arctic Ocean. Uh, the amount of ocean that's covered by sea ice has been greatly reduced. So that means that there's less light being reflected back into space um, and more sunlight is being absorbed and heating up the Arctic Ocean. Um, so, you know, those feedbacks are, are really, really uh, important. And uh, part of the reason why I say that these changes are like a freight train um, you know, once they get going, they tend to perpetuate themselves. Thank you. How will tides affect be affected by sea rise? Um, I don't think that in general tides will be that affected by sea level rise because the tides are basically controlled by by the sun and the moon. Um, there may be some effects where, you know, where you have a particular coastal geometry that changes. And so locally there might be a little effect, but overall I don't think tides will be very effective. Thank you. There's a few questions in relation to this. Uh, for the actively interested non-professional, what are the resources you might recommend to study Antarctica, its past and projected future? Hmm. Yeah. Um, I'm just trying to think. Uh, I mean, one of the, the types of articles that I think are really useful for, for um, you know, scientifically literate public is things like Scientific American articles. Um, you know, so um, those kind of articles are useful. 
Um, you know, unfortunately, I think the popular press is, um, you know, variable in how well it covers uh, things like uh, like ice sheets and sea level rise. I mean, you get some articles like in the New York Times or something that are actually on target. And then there is a tendency, you know, in places to exaggerate claims in some cases. Um, and certainly then, you know, if you go to the general internet, you can see all sorts of garbage. Um, <clears throat> so, um, but I think, you know, things like um, Scientific American or um, books that are published by actual, there's several popular books that are published by, by actual researchers in the field, um, you know, would be, would be good places to start. Thank you. Uh, next question, does your model assume the constant ocean currents as to velocity and location? Um, I don't actually do the climate models. Um, so I, th I think that the climate models have variable emphases, um, like some climate models will specialize in certain effects um, and other climate models will specialize in other effects depending on what the researchers think are the most important effects. Um, so I don't know specifically about which models would include that. Uh, the one thing I would say is that uh, like the IPCC reports, um, try to report some kind of consensus among different models. So, you know, some people would claim that the IPCC reports um, are too conservative and that the real sea level rise might be larger than that, um, you know, but partly that's because they, you know, they um, try to report kind of a consensus of all the models. And in some models may think that certain effects may, you know, may be larger. Thank you. So another one of the questions with regards to um, when will Canada run out of fresh water for melting glaciers? <laughs> I'm sorry, I can't really, I can't really uh, answer that because I don't really know where, I don't know that, you know, how they get their water in Canada for sure. Thank you. Would Australia slash New Zealand be affected by first by the loss of sea ice? Uh, well, sea ice doesn't go up to where those con where those countries are. So the only, I mean, the, the effect of the loss of sea ice on them would be just a climate effect. I know that, um, for example, Australia, you know, not just the ice part, but overall climate change can, there's a concern that it will cause even, you know, further drying uh, of some um, parts of the continent. Um, but that's not necessarily a sea ice um, issue. That's probably an overall climate issue. Thank you. So I'm probably going to butcher this question here, but has the Humboldt current been affected by the rising sea level effect on the US climate? Um, yeah, I don't know specifically about that. Um, like I, I'm not an oceanographer, so I, you know, I'm not really up to date on what, you know, is happening with the currents, um, the sea currents around North America. Thank you. So what, if any effects might the harvesting of natural resources affect landmass and turn ice formations or reductions. Currently the Antarctica has, the Arctic has become a contentious area related to exploration. Yeah, well, um, again, I don't know too much about all the, I know there's a lot of geopolitical issues in the Arctic. Um, the Antarctic is kind of interesting because it's governed by the Antarctic Treaty, um, you know, which uh, basically, um, you know, came about in the 19, around 1960 because different countries had claims to Antarctica and there was concern that militaries would become involved. And so it basically says that um, no country gives up their claims to Antarctica, um, but no country will try to enforce their claims to Antarctica and scientists should be free to go wherever they want uh, in Antarctica. 
Um, and in, you know, as an outgrowth of the treaty, there's discussions about you know, like tourism and environmental effects and things like that. Um, you know, it's generally been a very positive thing for Antarctica to be governed by this, um, by this treaty. There is some concern that, you know, at some future time, countries may withdraw from the treaty and start to try to, um, you know, monetize natural resources uh, in Antarctica. Um, I, you know, I think that's a legitimate concern probably um, for years down the road. Um, right now, a lot of resources in Antarctica wouldn't be, you know, it wouldn't be economically feasible to try to extract just because it's so remote. Um, and you'd need to build so much infrastructure to actually extract resources, but you know that might change in the future. Okay, thank you. So I think that wraps up um, the majority of the questions in relationship to your your research. Others were either more specified in parts of your uh, presentation, um, or there were a lot of questions with regards to your travel schedule, what your day looks like, et cetera. Um, so thank you again so much for taking the time to share your research with us. Well, thank you for the opportunity. I, I enjoyed it. I enjoyed, uh, you know, being able to share things and, uh, you know, the good questions. Thanks. All righty. So again, thank you all for joining us for the MLA Lecture Series. Um, there are MLA Lecture Series every Saturday in February. Um, the next lecture will be on uh, Saturday the 12th at the same time, starting at 11 a.m. It will be from uh, on Mindful Movement for Healthy Living. So again, I encourage you all to register um, at the University College website for the MLA Lecture Series, and we thank you all for taking the time to join us. Was there any other, um, anyone else wanted to say anything before we end the webinar? No, I'd like to, again, thank everybody for coming and um, hope to see you all next week. Thank you very much.